Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good morning and welcome to our second A More Perfect Union Colloquium event, Tracking Extremism, the FBI and Tracking the Capitol Rioters. Today's event is both in person and online. If you're joining us via Zoom, please post any questions in the chat and we will address them at the end of the presentation. Please remain on mute. Any and all comments should be civil. Today's guest is Professor Stephen Frechette. He currently serves as the Assistant Professor of Cybersecurity and Computer Information Systems at Bristol Community College. In this role, Professor Frechette develops, implements, and teaches advanced online coursework in networking technologies, cybersecurity, firewalls, operating systems, visualization, and risk management. Since a mob of rioters stormed the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021, the FBI has arrested more than 600 individuals in connection with the siege. Hundreds of perpetrators are still at large. Pos prosecutors have called this case unprecedented in scale and the most complex investigation ever prosecuted by the Department of Justice. In this eye-opening presentation, Learn how the FBI employs open source intelligence techniques using our personal smartphone data to establish probable cause and bring rioters to justice. When we began this project, when we began to plan this project, Professor Frechette was one of the first people we thought of to invite to present. I've personally attended his lectures on the dark web, on the topic of the dark web. I didn't attend them on the dark web. <laughs> Um, and I couldn't, be, I couldn't be more excited to welcome him to present today. Thank you, and here's Professor Frischet. Thank you very much, Emily. Uh, a pleasure to be with all of you today. And um, it's always a great topic to talk about because everybody saw what happened on January 6th. We all saw it in real time, but a lot of people don't actually know what happened after January 6th, and that's what I'm here to talk about today. So the title of this presentation is Tracking Extremism, the FBI and Tracking the Capitol Rioters. And what I'd like to talk to you, I'd like to actually begin this presentation 20 years ago because I think it's important to understand how we got into the situation that the, the country itself finds itself in as it pertains to like smartphone data and particularly wiretapping. So I have a couple of, uh, oops, let's see, how do I do this? There you go. So a couple of ground rules here for a presentation like this. Uh, this is a Zoom uh, presentation. The session is being recorded, okay? Um, if you've got some questions, just use the chat room or a parking lot uh, for some of those conversations, which can be tabled. Uh, and I want you to pay attention to the questions that I raise, and you can ask those questions of yourself internally, because I think it's important to understand that very powerful device that's in your pocket. And I want you to understand the technology that we use today and how it's changing the very fabric of, of society at, that we live in. And so I'd like you to ask to think openly and critical about the content that I'm about to share with you. So uh, this presentation begins on 9-11, okay? So I remember where I was on 9-11, and we just celebrated the 20th anniversary, er, anniversary of 9-11 a few weeks ago. And the picture on the right of the People magazine is the actual People magazine that I have in my cellic because I always remember this. I remember getting it in the mail because my wife used to subscribe to People magazine at the time. And I always remember this picture and of the second plane flying into the tower. And I always remember the, the headline on the New York Times and the font that you see on the U New York Times, I believe has only been used like once or twice in history, that big US attacked font. And for those of you who were around back then, I know we have some high school students here. I was 32 at the time. I was working in a technology company in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. And you just felt like the world changed, okay? And I'm not, so, I'm not so sure that it has changed from the better in retrospect. I think the United States has largely not really healed from that. I think we've just sort of adapted to this new reality. And what I mean by that is, uh, that we've become like a very fear-based society. So now after 9-11 happened, there was a great shift in our intelligence community. A lot of folks don't know this, that Department of Homeland Security was formed shortly after that. And of course, 22 agencies were merged under the Department of Homeland Security. There was a radical shift in the way our, 
our, commu our intelligence community was structured. This is where the creation of the TSA came in, and the TSA now is those folks, in case you haven't flown recently, that make you take your shoes off at airports and things like that. So flying itself has changed forever. But I will tell you the most important thing that has happened as a result of that event was the creation of the U.S. Patriot Act in 2001. And you say, well, what does the Patriot Act have to do with what I'm about to talk about today? So it comes down to this. Before the Patriot Act, okay, police could obtain the warrants for only one circuit at a time, and you had to prove it to a judge in a court that you had a reasonable uh, you, you had to, you needed that in order to prove uh, reasonable doubt for a particular criminal activity that you were trying to prove. So, for example, if you've ever seen the show The Wire, uh, which was a popular show, I, I would highly recommend anybody watch The Wire. Awesome show. The Wire was all, they call it The Wire because they were trying to wiretap this, this, this criminal gang in Baltimore. And the way that they would get around it was they would take the, the, the SIM cards out of their phones so that, because they would get a warrant to like surveil that particular phone and then these guys would just take the SIM card out and put in another SIM card and violate the whole uh, warrant. But after 9-11, authorities could obtain blanket authorization for a person and then monitor all communications to and from that person under a single warrant. And that is what has stayed largely intact today. We also have the National Security Agency, which is, you know, everybody, this is where all your conspiracy theories come in and what these guys do. What these guys do is they focus on cybersecurity and signals intelligence. And what they do is they take all of this data and they turn it into actionable intelligence. So you've got these three organizations that are sort of like, one is being created, this, you've got legal, things coming together and you've got the National Security Agency all intertwined in this relationship. And it's funny, I, I do have to mention Edward Snowden here. Regardless of what you think about er Edward Snowden, you may think he's a patriot, you may think he's a traitor, but what he did do, and I personally think it was a great thing, is that he sort of took the lid off what the NSA was doing and some of the information that they were collecting and how they were going about it. And it was really pervasive um, to some of the information you were collecting, my phone, your phone, every single conversation is being, um, is being uh, co recorded or, and uh, processed by the NSA. And so when Edward Snowden came al along, he sort of like lifted the lid on this. So when we got to that point, we can then say this was the result. We have these three things that are all overlapping. You've got the Patriot Act, which is the legal authorization to like look at people's information. You've got Department of Homeland Security, which is all of the administrative controls in order to, to do those things. And then you have the NSA, which has all of the technical ability to do some of these types of uh, things. So, so before 9-11, police could obtain warrants for only one circuit at a time, but after 9-11, authorities could obtain blanket authorization for a person and then monitor all communications. And that included, most importantly, internet service providers, the Verizons, the AT&Ts of the world, okay? Because the US Patriot Act allows ISPs to voluntarily, okay, and I put that in quotes because they're not really voluntarily sharing this information. They're more like voluntold to give the information. And it's a large, large range of information. And it allows the government to obtain detailed information on user activity through a subpoena, not a wiretap, okay? And that's the important thing. One of the things that Snowden revealed or uh, that I learned about from learning from him is that there is an actual secret court here in the government called FISA that actually adjudicates a lot of these types of things, that it's not in the traditional court system, it's sort of like a, like a pseudo court system that sits over there, okay? And the result of this has been warrantless wiretapping, which if you look at the true definition of the word, it's a violation of the Fourth Amendment um, for the rights to privacy. But under the Patriot Act and in the manner of homeland security and defending the nation, you know, we as citizens allowed these things to happen. Again, at the time, we didn't understand what was going on. We had been attacked. And so we just said, yeah, we, we need to like protect ourselves. And so there was a lot of changes to the laws as a result of that. And I wanna share with you this real quick. Um, 
one of the things, there was a great story uh, that I, I noticed uh, came into my feed uh, a couple of days ago, and it was about how, secret, how a secret Google geofence warrant helped, cap, capital, helped, cap, helped catch the Capitol riot mob. And um, what it is, and I, I'm going to explain what geofencing is, court documents suggest that the FBI has been using a controversial geofence search warrant at scale. This is the exact implementation of the Patriot Act, something that we as a society should be, I think, afraid of. And uh, they collect account information, location data on hundreds of devices inside the U.S. Capitol during that day. And geofence warrants are intended to locate anyone in a given area using digital services, the very services that we all depend on each and every day. And the thing is, it's like Google has been doing this for quite a while, and they leverage things like GPS data, Wi-Fi data, okay, Bluetooth signals, any type of signal that emanates from your device is fair game in these types of warrants, okay? And they are powerful and they are widely used. You need to keep that in mind, okay? So with that said, let's talk about smartphones just a little bit. So in the early days of smartphones, this is what we all had. Did anyone have a Nokia 3110? I know I did. These things were indestructible. You could like drop them off a building, pick them up, and they would just keep on going. I had, this was my first phone, okay? It was a 2G phone. It's about 20 years old now. And you can still get this phone, by the way. You still can get it. And at the time, it had a talk time of two hours, which is unbelievable. You just, you just couldn't believe it could be that good. And uh, the standby time was 11 days. The new 3310 has a talk time of 22 hours, and you don't have to charge this thing up for an entire month. So it's, it's pretty cool stuff. But the only thing you could really do with it was get text messages, okay? There was very limited uh, technology in the phone. It did like A, B, and C, very basic phone work, okay? Now today's phone is a lot different <laughs> than that smart, smartphone. So, and I'm gonna ask each and every one of you at some point to take the phone out of your pocket and take a look at that thing because I'm gonna show you some information that is on your phone. So the first thing that you need to know about today's smartphones is they are very, very chatty devices. They are always communicating, always on. Doesn't matter if you even have it, like you're logged off or anything like this. It is constantly, constantly pinging data out to the internet and the ecosphere, okay? And right off the bat, I can tell you that there are four unique areas on a smartphone. There's the physical device itself, the communication network that it uses, the operating system that it uses, and what we call an application layer, all right? Now, on in each of those layers, there are unique IDs that uniquely identify this phone to you. It doesn't matter if that, there's only one phone like this in the world that is uniquely, it cannot be spoofed because there's a uniquely hardware address inside the, this phone that uniquely identifies me. There's also an IMEI number, which is a string of numbers for every device. This is the social security number of your device. There's the SIM card, the IMSI number, the device IP address that you actually have. Your, your machine, your device has an IP address on it. Okay, but the most important thing, one of the things I'm going to talk about today is what we call Apple's IFA number or the Apple identifier. In Google, we have it. It's called our mobile ID advertising number. And this is how they found all the capital rise and this is how they're going to find them all. Okay, so in, in the application layer, there is your credentials, your username, your password to access app services. Um, permissions, all of the geolocation data, GPS, Wi-Fi, SMS, user data, all your contacts, all your files are there, okay? And I'm sure everybody is not doing a great job with security because there is more technology in this phone than there was on the original space shuttle, and so they're very complicated to understand and how to protect, okay? The other important piece that I want to know, know is that the shared data, the applications earn money by attracting users such as yourself, and then they sell that information via the IFA number. I'm going to show you what that looks like, okay? So inside your phone, all right, now this is a picture of my phone. I have a Google Pixel 3 XL, and um, inside your phone, you can find all of these numbers. They're right there in the about your phone. You can look them up. 
Okay? And you also can look up the area where, where location services are being used for your application. Okay? These are all unique IDs to your phone. All right? And why this is important, and when you can see all of these like sort of, you know, these forces sort of like converging upon each other, you look at the sheer number of people that have a device in their hand. There are five billion people, five billion. Actually, this is two years old, there's more than that now. Five billion people that have a device, okay? And most of these folks are internet users, they have active social media profiles, they, they, um, they use uh, things like um, you know, you know, Facebook, uh, Twitter, um, every type of game that you play on your phone is all part of this, and we we're all part of it. I, I'm I'm a part of it too. Okay, so I want you to kind of understand just how powerful this device is in your pocket. So, with that said, now I'm going to tell you about the really scary part for me personally is the mobile ad ID. All right. Now, if you've ever wondered why you can Google something, um, let's say you're interested in, say, I just bought this like Fitbit here, and I type in Fitbit, and I just want to find out the best type of Fitbit, I will get ads upon ads upon ads about my Fitbit. Not just to, like, to my email or anything like that, but in the applications themselves that I am using. And you say to yourself, how would I go into Google, type in Fitbit, and then have an ad appear in my Reddit feed about Fitbit, okay? So this is how advertisers interact with your smartphone. All right, so if you have an iPhone, you can do this now, okay? There's a privacy section on your phone, okay? And inside, it's called advertising. So Apple, if you've got an iPhone, this is the best part about Apple, okay? You can't see it, all right? They don't want you to see it, all right? It's a unique ID that they change, but they track you for your advertising purposes with this ID, okay? If you have a, um, an Android phone, it's a little easier. So in the middle of the screen are the pictures of my ad ID, okay? So you can see right there, my advertising ID is this like hexadecimal number right here, okay? It's this long hexadecimal, hexadecimal number. Now you could say to yourself, well, I want to just delete that number so that they can't track me. It's like, oh yeah, no, Google's not going to let you do that, all right? They are going to make you have a new ID, okay? If you try to opt out of interest-based ads, you will see ads, but they not be based on your interests. So if you clear your cache, you will lose your opt-out setting, which means you're going to get a new ID, all right? So I say all that to say this. Now we can actually talk about the Capitol rioters, all right? Hey, remember this guy here? Let me tell you about this guy. This guy is not having a good year, okay? He's still in jail, all right? He's uh, He's, they've tr I, 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 didn't, I didn't know who this guy was until I was preparing this presentation. I just know him because he was, he's like the face of the, of the riot itself. And uh, he is still trying to get out of jail. He's looking at 54 months in prison for, this, uh, for committing this felony. And um, he is exhibit A of what not to do, okay? So I took one case. If you can go to the Justice Department, you can look up any single one of these cases. They're all listed right on justice.gov. You can type it in, Capital Rioters, and you'll see all the affidavits. They all look like this on the right, okay? Now, the way that the FBI finds these guys, okay, is very, very simple. If you notice in this picture, there's a bunch of people walking around with their phones like this, okay? <laughs> I mean, given the 10 IDs that I just told you about, all right, the FBI knows who, every single one of these people. They know every single one of them and who they are. In fact, before like 7 p.m., they had already identified every single person within the fence at the Capitol riots because it's very easy, right? All the FBI has to do is say this. Who has the authority to be within this fence right here, okay, and that would have been the senators, you know, the, the, the vice president, and all of the, their staffers and everything like that. And everybody else that was in that fence that shouldn't have been there is going to prison, all right? They are going to get a knock on the door from the FBI. 
Okay, so everybody that had pushed, everybody you see in this picture has probably been rounded up. And in various ways, I mean, not everybody committed a felony, some people committed misdemeanors, but I will tell you, you wanna ruin your life fast, you know, get a felony conviction on your record, you won't be, it'll be very difficult for you to get home loans, car loans, or get employment, all of these types of things, okay? And so how they kept, and so how they produce probable cause is, the first thing that they do is they say, <laughs> They just say to the phone companies, it's like, who has this phone? And they, in the, of course, because of the Patriot Act, they say, well, here's all the information. I'm legally compelled to give you ever, all the information about these people, and so that they did. And the FBI has this long, long, long list of people that were in this area, okay? They also use things like video. People were posting videos on the internet, uniquely identifying all of these individuals that were in this place, okay? So if you notice right here, the guy in the circle, okay, he had like on a hooded, hooded hat, all right? And I chose this for one particular reason, because that guy right there is banging on the door at, the, uh, at that, when they were in the East Corridor, and the woman that the Capitol Police officer killed is standing right next to her. You can see her shoulder right there. This is. This is moments before she goes through the window in the Capitol riot and the Capitol police officer, you know, fatally shoots her, okay? So they instantly connect this guy to this guy via picture, then they prove it with the data on his phone, and it's an open and shut case for the FBI. You know, I think a lot of the, the reason why it's taken so long is they just have so many of these cases to prosecute. There's just only so many FBI, <laughs> FBI agents that can, like, address this stuff, okay? So even if they didn't have the smartphone, okay, there's so much evidence that people leave behind when they do this type of thing. They have uniquely identifying information. And again, people are posting this stuff on YouTube, social media, all right? Once you post something on social media, all right, like Facebook, if you read the user agreement, it becomes the pop property of Facebook, okay? You give up your rights to the very intellectual property that you're sharing with people, all right? So once this is all on social media, it can't be taken back. In fact, so many of these individuals tried to like, they went to the riot, they did their thing, and they tried to delete all their accounts, throw their phones in the trash, it was just too late. It's all on record with the ISPs, and it's all searchable via a subpoena. So here's an example of what it looks like. So the New York Times actually had somebody anonymously give them the phone details of who was there at the riot. So on the left side of the screen here, you're seeing a picture of Washington, D.C. So Trump has given his uh, pitch at the rally stage, and all the reporters are in attend all the supporters are attending the rally, and you can see the, ca the U.S. Capitol there on the right there. And so moments after he says, hey, go, you know, he instructs the crowd to go down there and, you know, and do their business, you can see all the cell phones. This, these, these dots represent the phones that are in people's pockets. And you can see all of the people pushing down towards the Capitol. You can see the, the very streets that they're walking down and the routes that they took to get there. All right. Now, once they get there, okay, you can then see on the left in the U.S. Capitol the, the actual fence that is around the Capitol. So anybody within that green area there, okay, within the, the identified fence is in violation of federal law, all right? So, and this phone is going to uniquely identify them inside that fence. It's an open and shut case, open and shut case. So this particular individual right here that was willing to share his information is named Ronnie Vinson. Don't know who this guy is. He went down there with his father-in-law and, um, I thought it would be a good idea to do it. And you can see just how this guy left his home in Kentucky, took his car, drove all the way, stopped in West Virginia, went all the way to Washington, D.C., and then joined the riot. I mean, it's so open and shut with these types of folks. You, and even then, you could see he was at this place at 7 a.m., okay, at his hotel. Then he, at 8.17, he went to the rally stage. Then at 1.48, it was at the Hyatt Regency, and then at 3 p.m., he was in the Capitol building, all right? So all of this stuff is all available on your phone, okay? Now, the things to understand about your phone, and especially about the way the apps work on your phone, 
is and I want you to pay attention to that mobile advertising ID because the way that it works, especially, you know, we teach a class here on database programming and SQL language. All of this information is in databases and these databases, these tables are connected by keys, okay? There are primary keys and there are uh, foreign keys, all right? The mobile ID is a key to each and every application that is on your, your database. That's what I was talking about, how like you can type in the word Fitbit and that Fitbit, you know, ad is going to find its way into some like Wordscape game or some like Farmville type game that's going to pop up on your thing because it's shared all across the, the apps that are on your phone. You could say, well, you know, I don't put any of my information in there. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, okay? Again, your name and ID and your number and where you live, your license number is all tied directly to this phone that is on record with AT&T or Verizon or whatever carrier that you choose. And all the FBI has to do is say, I know that this phone belongs to this particular person and has this mobile ad ID on it. Tell me, give me all the information on these apps and tell me all of the information that is contained in this. And Google is just gonna hand it over because your mobile ID is on Parler, Facebook, Twitter, any of these types of apps that any of these types of people were using, any, it doesn't matter whether the information was encrypted or not, it is, you are dead to rights with this kind of stuff. And this is a perfect example of how the Patriot Act would allow companies to do this type of wide area surveillance on people. Now, there's two, th there's two schools of thought on this. First, this is a good thing right? Because we were able to, the riot happened, there were lots of bad guys there, the FBI went and caught the bad guys, and that's the way it's supposed to work. But on the other hand, do we, as a society, do we want this level of surveillance on our own personal phones? Largely, the technology is largely above many people, and we're not handling these things responsibly, especially the way that we would handle like our own hygiene. I always make this analogy between your own personal hygiene and your digital hygiene, okay? So the thing that I want to, the, the one thing that I want to drive home in this presentation is this. You are not anonymous on the internet. Don't try and do it, you're not, okay? Because you sign up for a cell phone provider, okay, your information is available to the AT&Ts and the Verizons of the world, and if, the, and if a police and if the police want access to that information, all they have to do is ask them for it in a court of law and they can get it. All they have to do is have reasonable suspicion for a particular crime and, they, and then they will give it over to them, okay? You should always keep that in mind. All right, so now what can I do about it? All right, so there's some things that you can do about it and I, I do wanna say that one of the things that has happened in society is we've gotten so dependent on these devices for like communication, working with our banks, um, just seeing pictures of our kids and our grandkids and all these kind of things. It's like you, you have to make some peace with, um, with transparency versus security, right? You, you, we're always trying to strike that balance. If you try and live your life without this phone, you can do it. It's not easy. It's not easy. I mean, I've tried it. You, it's, it's really not easy. You can do it. It's much easier to adopt a security mentality with, with these types of phones in order to protect yourself from these types of things. Okay. So look, I want to mention a couple of things here. I use this tool called Privacy Badger. Privacy Badger is a nice tool that you can download and put on your phone. Everything I'm going to show you is free. All right. And this is going to keep a lot of the advertisers off your, off your, um, off your phone okay and off your computer system and it'll just reduce the amount of like if I say Fitbit you know my privacy badge will not allow the Fitbit ad to like go to my other applications it just sort of stops it okay so privacy badger is a good way and it enables what we call do not track on your phone okay so that's the first good thing I would tell you I would also go to EFF.org which is an organ a nonprofit organization that really does a lot of work in this area and they will tell you that if you want to go to a, a protest and you want to like make your, make your voice known, um, there are certain things that you should do. The, and they will tell you the first thing you should not do is bring your cell phone, 
okay? You don't want to bring the very thing that could identify you in a cell phone. I mean, I could do a whole nother presentation on how the people in the Black Lives Matters um, protests were all tracked down by like nefarious FBI techniques, OSINT, you know, matching tattoos that they, they got from, from pictures of helicopters that they could match up to people, and then they would just do forensic analysis. All legal, all fair game because of the way our public information is dispersed, okay? So EFF.org has the surveillance self-defense, there are lots of tips and techniques and how to live a safer online existence, which I would highly recommend that you do. There's also a downloaded sheet that you can do and EFF has all of this information, how to handle malware, how to handle adware, stalkerware. If you've got young kids, you know, especially like teenagers that are just getting their smartphones in their hands for the first time, you want to educate them on how to protect themselves online, okay? It's very, very important, especially for teenagers. I'll share one story at the end of this presentation, what I mean by that. Oh, I'm at the end, so. <laughs> so I will tell you that um, before the Capitol riots, there was one profound event that happened that um, where there was a student on an internship, not at this, or not at this school, um, and was, you know, there was a, a younger student that was infatuated with the, intern, the internship who was doing an, uh, an internship and then used this phone to like, you know, carve into their like uh, YouTube area, um, started building a whole set of information, um, making like, um, getting into their email, sending these, all these types of things and it was just really bad. And it's like, I always say to myself, it's like, like students, like, or young, young teenagers don't understand exactly what these things can do, all right? Especially in Massachusetts, the bar for a felony in Massachusetts is so low, okay? And all it would take was, would be for some student to like cross the line like that and, and you know, have a, have a parent like prosecute that. And that student could just, you know, maybe they had a crush on the person, but just through these activities without proper education, they could commit a felony type of act that is going to do the very, screw up their lives in the very ways that I was just speaking about with the Capitol rioters, okay? So I always like to give this presentation because the Capitol rioters represent what you should never, well, you should never do any of that, but you should never, you should understand exactly what this thing can do, okay? And how it can incriminate you instantly. And I will tell you that geofencing is a thing, okay? Um, I mean, I would tell you, we can, have set up, we can set up technology here, uh, you know, in any area where we could shut your Wi-Fi on. As soon as you walk into the fence, you could shut it off when you walk into the fence. If you called in a bomb threat in this area, we could instantly track it down to like where you are, okay, just based on device IDs and locations, just like I said. And in fact, you see that from time to time. It's, you know, a disgruntled person will make a, like a, a remark uh, about, or I want to do this, or I want to do that. Very easy to like find these people like very quickly in order to like solve that issue, okay? So that's all I really wanted to say today and I wanted to just leave it for some questions if you had some questions about these phones and I'd be happy to, happy to answer them to the best I can. Sure, so what can the FBI use? The FBI can use anything that is legal, all right? They can use um, video that you post, okay? Any type of video on YouTube, Facebook, it is all fair game, all right? Um, doesn't matter, any type of ad, anything that is free and is legal, they can use. And that's what we mean by open source intelligence, right? The FBI isn't like, throwing dusting fingerprints around to try and find the Capitol rioters where they touch the window. They don't have to do any of that kind of stuff, all right? All they have to do is look up the data on their phone, all right? And if they don't have like really corroborating data, they'll go to YouTube, Facebook, and match up videos and do profiles, just like I showed you there, until they have an ironclad case, and then they just hand it to the judge, and the judge is just gonna like, you know, you know 
due process and process the sentence for whatever they did, whatever they did. okay? Um, another question we have, um, what if the Patriot Act did not exist? How long would it have taken the FBI to track the virus? <laughs> well, that's the thing. It, like, you probably couldn't do it. Like, how would you be able to collect all that data on all, that, on all those people? You would have had to have gone to a judge and say, you know, if the, you know, if we've got this person, John Doe here, and you think, an FBI agent thinks that they're guilty of this, they would have to go and convince a judge to give them a subpoena and a warrant to survey that particular phone, okay? And they would have had to have done that for everybody in that Capitol riot building, all right? Now, again, that's what I say. It's a slippery slope, right? You want to catch the bad guys, but at the same time, it's like, you know, it's all about, like, personal freedom as well, you know? It's a, it's a very slippery slope, which is why this is such an important issue. That's a great question, because on the one hand, you would want to support these kind of things, because you think that just, you want justice to be served, but on the other hand, you don't want to saw off the very branch that you're sitting on in terms of your personal freedoms, okay? So it's not so much about hacking your phone, it's like when you're, tracked. yes, yes, if your phone is off, yes, okay, yes, your phone can be tracked. It's always tech, you should always assume that your phone is on and chirping. In fact, right now, it's doing that very thing, okay? It's, it's out there, it's sending packets out to the cell phone tower, it's communicating with your apps, all these types of things, location data, where you're, where you're sitting, all of these types of things, it's always on. It's always on. Always remember that. It's always on. Can the FBI track a burner phone? So yes, they can track a burner phone. It's just that they would not be able to, tr so they would have to like match the burner phone to the individual who has it. So the burner phone itself would have to have been activated onto the cell phone network. Okay. I think the only way you could probably get around it is if you had a satellite phone, that might be more difficult. But again, if you're in the, if you're just an average Joe, you know, you want to go like, you know, throw rocks at a building or something because you don't like something, um, and you go and you buy a phone and you think that's going to keep you safe, I mean, I promise you, the FBI's going to find you, okay? So how invasive to our privacy are interactive devices like Siri, Alexa, or Ask Google? Yes, yeah, so I would never put that device in my house, okay? Ever, ever, ever. All right. You can do some really interesting experiments with that. Um, if, you, if you're really interested in, like, say, salsa music, and you've, you're, you're asking your device, Alexa, or Hey Google, or whatever, to um, play salsa music, you're going to start to see your advertising change to that thing. I'll give you a perfect example. All right. So I have YouTube TV because I'm a huge football fan. I like to watch football on Sundays. And so I put YouTube TV on, and I stream it to a, t a television in my, uh, out on my deck. So I watch TV. Well, when they break away, because remember, it's YouTube TV. It's not NBC. It's not CBS. It's YouTube TV. The ads that I get are completely different than anybody else gets. I get ads based on Fitbits, um, sneakers, or if I've typed in something into my search bar about like education, because I'm in the higher ed area, I will get ads for colleges and things like that from places like you would have never dreamed about. The entire experience is completely catered to me because of this, all right? The way that I interact with technology also interacts with me, okay? It's, a, it's not just a one-way street, it's, a, it's mutual, okay? And so you wanna keep that in mind as well, how they do it, all right? Did I answer that question? Yep. So I don't use Siri, I don't trust any of that stuff, thank you, Steve. Um, but one of the things that I have noticed is that I feel like the microphone is listening to me. So like my husband and I will probably, like we need new blinds for our windows, and all of a sudden we're getting ads for blinds. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it's, yes. There is what, is we call, there is what we call, um, there's data, and then there's what we call metadata, all right? So, the computer 
is the data, and that's the IP address is like the metadata, okay? So a lot of these algorithms work on metadata. If you're sitting there talking into a device that say, I'm interested in blinds, is your phone listening to you? Yes, <laughs> okay, it is. I know you don't want to believe that, but it does do these types of things. Not like so like blatantly, but what it does is this like powerful, powerful algorithms that are behind the scenes that are doing all of this type of work in order to bring the world closer to you. Remember, like, it, this is really a business decision. Like, marketing is very, very expensive in order to find you or you or you and, and try and figure out that these are the kind of sneakers that you want, okay? It's not, it's much, much, it's much more effective for them to, under, to get all your data, analyze it, and then target a single ad to you because that's what advertisers want. They don't want to like send out millions of postcards. They want to target you and you only. And that's what advertisers are paying for, all right? Advertisers pay for like Facebook advertising, all these types of things, because they're trying to uniquely find you. They're trying to know every single thing about you. And when they do, they're going to try and sell you what they believe that you want, all right? One thing that, there's always a famous example where uh, a young girl had gotten pregnant and she started getting, um, flyers from like CVS about like baby formula and things like that and she hadn't even told her parents yet that she was pregnant you know so she had just typed it into the feed but the algorithm knew that she was pregnant before her parents it actually you know she did all right so those are the types of like predatory types of advertising that can go on and the thing is is this the more information you give them the more targeted those ads are going to be okay Yeah, so I will tell you that the most powerful advertising machine on the, in, in the world right now is, has to be Facebook. I mean, they have powerful, powerful advertising metrics to do that, and it is extremely powerful. I will tell you that, I mean, it's probably by now a $50 billion industry that happens below the surface. The moment that I, you type in Fitbit, okay, it goes out into an ad network. Now, if somebody is going to want to bid on that, ad network. Somebody like you is going to say, hey, I sell Fitbits, all right? Who wants to pay to have the very next thing that this person clicks on have a Fitbit ad in it, okay? And so their algorithm says, I'll pay 0.01123 cents in order to have that ad up there. And then what do you know? There it is, okay? And if they click on that, all right, that completes the, the entire marketing process. I've, I have a product, you have a need, I want to connect you to me so that I can sell you this product, okay? So yes, that does happen wow. very profitably. Wow. In fact, that network itself was developed by theoretical physicists. I mean, the, the technology is immensely complicated in order to do these types of like um, corroborations between information and the people that use them. Well, so data protection is really a function of the people who own the data, all right? So your security is only as good as the security controls that the organization puts around it. So if you're using an, uh, I'll use Parler as an example. Parler, okay, everybody who was in the Capitol riot, you know, uh, who was in that thing, always were all using Parler. <laughs> That's amazing. The first thing that happened was, you know, good guy hackers, whatever you want to call them, went out and they stole all the data from Parler because it was completely unprotected. You believe that you were given Parler all your information and you were completely safe. Oh, no, you were not, okay? All of that information went right to the FBI via these people who stole it because Parler had no interest in protecting uh, the security of that data, all right? So if you don't you have to understand that your data resides with the, with the application or the service or the institution that has that data. And you're only as safe as the, the security controls that are put around that data, okay? So it's a personal decision on how you use your data. I'm very careful about that kind of stuff. Sometimes you, 
you just need to use a certain service in order to get the benefit of it, you know, but I'm always interested, I'm always curious about that. I have one more question from our online participants. What do you think of DuckDuckGo? So DuckDuckGo is great. That's pretty much um, a, uh, the way DuckDuckGo works is it provides you all of the search results without all of the, the Google-ish, um, um, you know, that pervasive Google feel, right? So the way DuckDuckGo works is they will like do anonymous searching to get the information that you need. The problem with DuckDuckGo is it, it can be a little slower, okay? And the results that you get may not be as rich as say you would get with, with Google. Again, Google's really great, but it's also really nefarious as well. So if you are a tinfoil hat person and you want complete anonymity, Yes, you can live a life of DuckDuckGo and Tor browsers and things like that, but it's very difficult to like, you know, use the, uh, use the technology at scale and at speed with those types of things. So I would always tell you, if you're going to go out and do something really uh, nefarious, you want to go and, um, you know, go into the dark web or anything like that, you would always want to use, uh, first of all, I would tell you not to do it because the FBI sits in those places, okay? They're down there waiting for you, all right? They hang out in the sewers of society and the, the technology areas, all right? But if you wanted to go down there and participate in some of these areas, you would have to have total anonymity about it. And very few people have the technical skills or the technical kung fu to actually make sure that all, every single track is covered, okay? So DuckDuckGo is a good way to like do anonymous type searching. But Use a VPN in order to protect your privacy. That would be also something that I would recommend. Awesome. Uh, one last one is banking on our phone safe. So I want to say this about banking on your phone. The safest, the safest way to buy something is with Google Pay or Apple iPay. And you say, what? You just told me all about the phone and how bad it is. But the way that it works is if you use your phone in order to purchase something, okay, the personal, the PAN number, that uniquely identifies your um, credit card number and the information, when you use an app like iPhone, it, the first thing it does is it spoofs the, the number, okay? So it changes your credit card number to another number, okay, that is only known by like Visa, all right? And if you look at your phone, that key, that little square metal thing on your credit card, that is actually a private key. That's why only the credit card company can send you that key. So that private key is what encrypts the number before it's sent off to do the, pro for the, uh, the processing, all right? If you go up to a gas station and you, don't ha and you have just a regular old credit card and you do a mag swipe and you swipe it, none of the private key is involved. It's just all in clear text. So you always wanna have a card that has that. So when you buy something with Google Pay or Apple Pay, you have the most powerful um, protection for your transaction. It's, it's always counterintuitive. I give this presentation, you, I tell you how bad these things are, but then I tell you that they actually can be very good for banking, all right? So online banking is totally fine, all right? Just make sure that you set two-factor authentication up, okay? You have a challenge response type thing. I don't know if you've done this, maybe you do. If you go to like your bank, you have to choose a picture, all right? Have you ever seen this? Yeah. Only a picture that you would know all right, so the first thing you do is you send your username over, not your password, always notice this. You send your username over, all right. Then you get the picture back, and then it says, is this your picture? And it's like, I always choose a musical instrument, so it's like, oh, yep, that's it. And it's like, then I put my password in, then my password goes forward, okay? So that's what we call banking users that challenge response for like extra authentication and extra security, all right? And if you add two-factor authentication in there, you're pretty much good to go. And if somebody steals all your banking information after you do all those things, you should probably stand up and clap because you must have, you must be somebody worth stealing from, okay? I never say that security is 100%, you know, you can never say that. But you can do things to like make it 95, 96, 97% safe, okay? The, the last thing I would say before we end this presentation, everybody gets a free credit report each and every year. You should go and pull your credit report even if you don't have a credit card or you haven't started your life yet in such a way, those are oftentimes the most vulnerable people because nobody's looking at their credit reports. I've seen many cases 
where a parent will take out a credit card in the child's name and fill up the credit card, you know, and then the child goes to like, you know, get married and graduate and they've got all these like debts on their credit report. You want to make sure that nobody's using your credit report in a false way, all right? It's always a good idea to go out and check that and you can actually secure your credit report to make sure that nobody's poking around on it. That's a, that's a good idea. Thank you, Steve. Yay. If anybody else has any questions, you can just forward them to Emily or forward them to my email at stephen.forchette at bristolcc.edu and I'll be happy, happy to respond and give you some advice if you've got some personal questions, okay? I've got a did. That was really quite incredible. Thank you, Steve. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending today's presentation. We hope your experience was enlightening. Um, our next presentation for the colloquium will happen on October 25th at 11 a.m. We will welcome professors Ron Weisberger and Robin Worthington to present dangerous ideas, misinformation, and stereotypes in history. I would also like to remind you of the lecture and discussion, All the Horrors of War, A Jewish Girl, A British Doctor, and the Liberation of Bergen Belsen, um, which will be hosted by Dr. Bernice Lerner. And it occurs this Thursday, October 7th at 4 p.m. and is hosted by the Holocaust and Genocide Center here on campus. Thank you all so much for coming. We hope to see you next time for our next event. And thank you for your support. <laughs>